Booster is excited to support DIA Schools Collaborative on furthering the missions of our respective organizations through Follow to Lead podcast and other DIA programming. Visit ChooseBooster.com for details on Booster's school fundraising events, technology, and customized spirit gear. Booster can help your Catholic school meet and exceed its fundraising goals. Learn more today. Welcome to Follow to Lead, where we discover how to listen for and follow God's call so that we might lead others to God. Our shared stories of inspiration from religious leaders and those active in the educational ministry of the church can help you know better how God is calling you and the role passionate Catholic education plays in spreading His message of faith, hope, and love. Now please welcome the hosts of Follow to Lead, Father Randy Sly and Kyle Pietrantonio. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ the teacher, teach us to listen. Teach us to do the deep listening to the sounds of our soul, waiting to hear your voice calling us to cast out deeper, to become fishers of men and women, shepherds of souls, to follow your will in order to lead others to the truth, beauty, and goodness only you can offer. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Follow to Lead, a journey twice a month into the world of Catholic education, exploring what it means to follow God in order to lead others to Him. I'm Father Randy Sly, your co-host. And I'm Kyle P. Trantonio. Today, we'll have the pleasure of talking with Mike Irwin. Mike is the founder of Father Vincent Capadona High School in Vast, North Carolina, near Fort Bragg a 2002 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Mike served in the Army on active duty for 13 years, including three deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. He's currently a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves. In 2010, Mike founded Team Red, White, and Blue, a nonprofit organization that enriches veterans' lives by connecting them to their community through physical and social activity. In addition, Mike's the co-founder of the Positivity Project, an organization which equips pre-K to 12 schools with digital resources, training, and strategy to teach positive psychologies, 24 character strengths, and empower their students to build positive relationships. He also serves as the founding chairman of the board for Father Vincent Capadona High School outside of Fort Bragg. Mike earned his master's degree in positive psychology and leadership under the tutelage of Chris Peterson from the University of Michigan and taught leadership at West Point. He's the co-author of the book, Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude, as well as Leadership is a Relationship, How to Put People First in the Digital Age. Mike and his wife, Genevieve, live on a 32-acre homestead outside of Fort Bragg with their five children. Mike, welcome to the program. Hey, great to be here, Kyle. Father Randy, excited for the conversation and to cover uh, as much ground as we can. Well, it sounds great, Mike, and we are really glad that you're with us today. And, you know, we have a lot to cover, uh, but one of the things we like to do in our programs with each of our guests is to have you share a little bit of background about yourself. So could you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Absolutely. So born and raised in Syracuse, New York, uh, neither of my parents went to college. Uh, my mom was actually the first police officer on the Syracuse Police Department back in 1974. That's oh. where she met my dad. My dad was a uh, sergeant on the police department. And I uh, grew up there. I was the oldest of four kids. I went on and graduated from Christian Brothers Academy. And I played baseball there. And then from there, I attended, as you mentioned before, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. I played baseball there and trained to become an Army officer um, between 1998 and 2002. But uh, it's been quite the journey ever since then, because 9-11 took place at the start of my senior year, uh, which set me on a very different trajectory than the one I thought I was getting into. Uh, I chose to branch military intelligence, and from there, uh, went on to serve uh, all over the world and all over the United States. Well, that sounds really good, and uh, I'm just wondering, uh, 
9-11 happening at that time. So what was your trajectory before that and then before you got into military intelligence? So I thought that probably the most dangerous place that I would go would be South Korea or Bosnia. And uh, when I was actually, 9-11 uh, took place actually one week before we made our decisions about what branch we would go. And I was leaning towards going field artillery, but once we realized over and over again, we heard on the news about, you know, this was an intelligence failure. This is going to be critical to the future for our nation to be better at intelligence. That really primed me and pushed me in that direction to, to choose mm -hmm. to, to go serve as an intelligence officer. So how did you get into leadership from there? Are you, uh, were you uh, kind of intrigued with the leadership training you were getting in the military and decided to focus then for your master's? Absolutely. So we, West Point often uh, is referred to as a leadership laboratory. So for 47 months from the time you show up until the time you graduate, there you're being you're learning how to follow first and then you're given given a little bit of leadership responsibility as in being put in charge of one person in your sophomore year and then you get more responsibility and more responsibility and you're learning and you're failing and you're making mistakes and you're doing all of that as part of your leadership growth while you're there you're also hearing from leaders and so you're just immersed in a sea of leadership when you're at west point as a cadet and so then i went out to the army and honestly as an intelligence officer, you're not doing nearly as much of the direct leadership that you see from infantry or artillery or different branches. And so, uh, you know, I remain very interested and compelled by this concept of leadership, but I actually went back and applied to go back and teach at West Point. And, and when I was accepted, they sent me to the University of Michigan. And I was there actually before to study leadership, I was there to study positive psychology. And okay. really what I did is my focus in my studies, my grad school thesis and all that lay at the intersection of positive psychology and leadership. In other words, what can we learn from positive psychology to help us become? Mike, when we got to connect over dinner a few weeks ago, I enjoyed hearing some of your stories uh, of your family on the homestead. And uh, this is an area where I've got some Catholic friends in Georgia who have done uh, homesteading, uh, but many of our listeners might not be that familiar uh, with this concept. Um, could you share a bit about life on this 32 acre homestead uh, for our listeners? Absolutely. I, I was just on a big, uh, you know, there was a big conference and I, and I kind of piped in virtually to talk about this. And I think, honestly, Kyle, that more and more people are interested in this concept and about learning more about it. You know, I grew up and because of the military, I spent pretty much my entire first 40 years of my life living in the suburbs. And my wife and I like to joke that we both had a midlife crisis at the same time as we were getting ready to turn 40 years old. Uh, and we moved outside of the quaint village of Pinehurst where there's all kinds of strict rules about like where your trash can can be and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And for whatever it was, we felt God talking at our heart and, and saying like, you should look to go out there and to find some land. And um, I still, honestly, you know, this is one of those things kind of like starting team red, white, and blue. Um, like when, when my wife was 39 weeks pregnant with uh, our first child, like some of these things you just, you can't pin your finger on what made you make that leap. And this is one of those things, but it's been such a journey and, and a blessing, um, a journey in humility, to say the least. We are coming up on three years. We moved out here in May of 2019. So uh, in three years, uh, we have learned a tremendous amount. But, you know, part of it has become this journey to better understand, uh, you know, the, the complexity of doing like all these things in life, you know, whether it be growing your own food, raising animals, taking care of the land, like all of that, you know, there's just not been, uh, you know, in our society, like nearly as much of a need for that because over the past 50 years, right, a lot more of that has been taken and planned for you to include, like, for example, on your land, you learn very quickly, you need to know where the water is going to move when you get a big rain. Well, when I lived in Pinehurst, they designed and engineered everything. So we knew the water was going to go down the hill into a storm drain. It was going to move out here to there. Like other people had decided that and made that decision for us. And so it's put a lot of pressure on us uh, as parents and as people to start thinking about the consequences of what happens in, in, in problem solving when things do go wrong. Like the pigsty gets 
filled back up with water? How do you got to get it out? Right. So, um, you know, we have out here, uh, two beef cattle. We're thinking about getting a dairy cow. We've got pigs, goats, uh, dogs, ducks, which by the way, most people don't know, but ducks lay eggs. They're really good. They're also really big. Um, and then we have chickens and, um, and we've also have raised some of Thanksgiving turkeys and, uh, meat chickens. So, uh, we got bees, an orchard, uh, a greenhouse and, uh, and a vegetable garden. So there, there's, we've got a lot, uh, of a little, so. Well, pardon the expression, uh, Mike, but what an organic education yeah. for your kids. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sure they're learning as much as you and Genevieve are, um, about a lot about life, uh, through that, that homesteading model. They are, that's to say the least. And it's been, it's been exciting for us to see that in them. And, and going back to final point, Kyle, I would make on that is not only are they learning, but they're, they're learning to work. You know, I grew up having a paper route and raking right. leaves, shoveling driveways and mowing lawns. Uh, as a nine to 15 year old. And those opportunities like have all been professionalized by adults and by companies. And there's not nearly the many as many opportunities for kids to be pushed to do work. And so here there's real consequences. If you don't go out and feed the goats or pick up the chicken eggs or close the door, like there's, there's real consequences. And I love that pressure that like our kids are having to learn to live with as just a part of their life. Cause of course, as we all know, as adults, we feel that kind of pressure all the time and kids getting that experience this young is, is invaluable. That's awesome. I have some friends, Mike, that uh, have done some homesteading out in Virginia. One of the things that they've done is they have basically parceled off parts of the land so that the family members, as they continue to get older, can uh, build their own homes and basically establish a family uh uh, community there. Is that kind of what's in the back of your mind too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing a, a real big movement here in Moore County of other people getting into this. And, we, and I, you know, we actually see a lot of this across the nation. There's a big push for Catholic homesteaders. Right. And, you know, it's been, it's been interesting to see how, and in our case, we homeschool, right? So we, the combination of homeschooling and homesteading is, you know, we're really trying to create this concept around education. And a lot of this is kind of matriculated its way into the Father Capadano vision. But, you know, I think we've often viewed and started to view more and more education as this like thing that like you've got to get through to get a certification or to get a qualification or to move on to the next step in life. And as we all know, especially in the information age that we live in today, like learning never ceases, you never stop learning. And, and so to develop a passion for learning and problem solving is something that I see a lot more people tying into their Catholic faith. And so we see a lot more Catholic and, and other you know, friends of different Christian denominations getting into this more home style, uh, more uh, homesteading lifestyle. Um, and it's been very fascinating to see like all the different lessons that they're learning depending on where they're at in the journey. Cause we're now three years in and I look back at the past three years and say, wow, whew, that first year was real. That was rough. You know, and, and now I see people in year one of it right now, and now I can be support to them and say, hey, there's going to be some days when you feel like the devil is hard at work trying to drive you out of here, which is how we felt. Our entire pond, we lost all of our fish due to uh, duckweed. It just blanketed the entire pond. We had hornet's nests, hawk attacks, coyote attacks on our chickens. Um, lots of those kinds of factors. You could just feel like the devil pushing hard at work. And I think that a lot of people you know, feel that in year one, because there's a lot of inertia that you're trying to overcome. That's awesome. Like, uh, there almost needs to be a DIA like uh, network or uh, collaborative <laughs> of, of Catholic yeah. homesteaders. Uh, I think, Mike, that might be your next project. Speaking right. of projects, Mike, uh, you're really become the architect of, of three, uh, and we could probably do three separate podcasts. And we certainly want to get to uh, your work with Father Vincent Capadano High School. But we'd like to take just a little bit of time talking about Positivity Project and Team Red, White, and Blue. And let's start with Team RWB, uh, which focuses on enriching the lives of your veterans as you put the ball cap on to represent. Tell us a bit about the genesis of Team Red, White, and Blue, uh, Mike. So after my third deployment, so I did Iraq once, Afghanistan twice, uh, I went to grad school at the University of Michigan, as I mentioned earlier, and I got there and I felt, frankly, like a bit of a fish out of water. Um, I looked around, Facebook was very nascent at the time. I looked around and I saw some of my former soldiers that I had led had transitioned on. 
beyond the military. And, and a lot of them were not doing very well. And I thought to myself, geez, like I still am in the army receiving a paycheck and have uh, healthcare and my sense of identity of being a soldier. I still have all of that. And I'm struggling. Imagine if all those were taken away from you and you just left the army or you just left the Marine Corps, the Navy, the Air Force. And I remember thinking to myself, there's got to be something that I can do. I'm here in grad school for two years. Grad school is uh, about 15 hours of work in class with maybe an additional 30 hours, you know, 15, 20 hours. Bottom line, there's 168 hours in a week. And, and I said to myself, like, I've got to be able to, you know, take 20, 25, 30 hours a week and be able to make a difference and do something. And so I went and I visited the local VA hospital in Ann Arbor. And I met with this big social worker there who is doing, you know, work with post 9-11 veterans and all the way back to Vietnam veterans and talking about the challenges that so many of them faced in reintegrating into society. So long story short is I was a big ultra runner uh, at the time. I was big into doing, you know, marathons and ultra marathons. And I said, can we start it? If I started an organization that raised money to support veterans by doing marathons and physical challenges, what would, what would we want to use the money for? And she said, without missing a beat, like just helping veterans to get out and to meet other people in their community. And so that's what, that's what was the genesis of Team Red, White, and Blue, um, March of 2010. Um, and very quickly, we realized we were onto something, but we were not like most entrepreneurial endeavors. We didn't have it quite right at the beginning. We started out thinking that we were going to raise money to support wounded veterans, when very quickly we found that there's a lot of veterans that were benefiting from Team Red, White, and Blue who did not, you know, did not recognize or didn't say, hey, I'm wounded, um, but they were very much struggling, often with the invisible wounds of war. And so they found tremendous value and benefit in coming out and being a part of a team and being physically active. And the big piece of that you know, for all of us was recognizing that we there's a lot of veterans out there that could really benefit from being more physically active in their life. Right. Because when you're in the military, you have to be physically active. That's part of the deal. But when you leave it, most veterans are like, ah, that's behind me now. Like, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. And so um, there's a lot of benefits, not just physical, but mental and emotional that come from, you know, from, from being physically active. So, yeah, we're about a quarter million members, give or take, you know, 150 plus chapters across the nation. And, you know, our focus very much is how do we help veterans to realize that their best days are not behind them. Their best days, in fact, are in front of them. And that if they uh, can stay healthy, they can take care of themselves, eat healthy, get enough sleep, all those basic you know, uh, health functions. If they can do those, that their best days are and remain in front of them, you know, not behind them. Great. And, you, you know, know it's interesting. A, a transformational grant, Mike. We did. Tell us, we, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, we received uh, yeah six million dollar gift uh, from Mackenzie Scott uh, about two months ago. So uh, pretty significant for us. You know, when you get into the nonprofit space, uh, as as we all know, who spent time there, you can work hard, really, really hard for a really long period of time, and sometimes, you know, uh, like opportunity meets luck meets you know whatever it might be. But um, for us here, yeah, it's been it's been huge. It's going to allow us to do some really big things that. We've wanted to do for a long time, but we haven't had a chance to do um, just due to financial constraints. And so I very much view this as kind of like venture capital money. Like we're not being given this to like sit back. We're being given this to invest in it and to accelerate the mission. You know, Mike, it's interesting. I ran into Team Red, White and Blue last year uh, at an event here in Kansas City. Um, I have a grandson who died of cancer. Uh, but before he did, he started this little bandage project that since grew into a 501c3 foundation uh, for children's pediatric cancer research. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. we have this uh, 5K run every year. And last year we were getting organized and I was there, you know, working the run. And there was this tent and it had this team red, white and blue logo on it. So I was able to go over and talk to the guys. And uh, I want to tell you at the grassroots, the enthusiasm and the excitement uh, that uh, they had for what they are doing was uh, just really uh, very engaging and captivating. And, you know, and awesome, as a yeah. Vietnam veteran, uh, I was very excited about this because one of the things, and, and you know this about as a veteran, many times you can't talk about a lot of the stuff that you experienced with others. You need to find those who have gone through what you've gone through. And it's neat when you can do that and use it as an opportunity to be injected uh, back into society. 
Absolutely spot true. Spot on. I mean, it's you know, having that, the ability to have the conversation and especially over a walk or a run, um, it just, it's, it's been transformational for so many people to be able to do that. Absolutely. Father. And where can you find out more about team red, white, and blue if people are interested? So yeah, see so just simple enough, you know, team rwb.org. Um, and, and we're on, so, you know, the various social media channels like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, but yeah, um, you can go to our website or you can also go and download our app and join the team. You go to the app store, just type in team RWB and you can download it and become a member. And, and interesting fact, 30% of our members are not veterans. They're people who just want to be a part of the team and they want to support military veterans in their transition and in their post-military mm-hmm. lives. Mike, the other project that you've been instrumental getting off the ground is the uh, one around positivity. Uh, and we'd like for you to share a bit about the positivity project and, and how it can support schools um, in, in its work. Absolutely. So starting back in 2015, uh, I was posting on social media a little bit of uh, a guy, my academic mentor, uh, and guidance uh, and guide from the University of Michigan, Dr. Chris Peterson. He tragically died of a heart attack in October of 2012. And I've been posting about him sporadically, you know, um, you know, since he passed. But uh, one of my friends reached out and said, hey, I see you posting about positive psychology. Is this something that we can teach the kids? And, you know, my oldest was uh, six years old at the time. He was in kindergarten at St. John Paul II here in Southern Pines. And I said, you know, I don't know, but I think so. And uh, so we kind of quickly threw together a game plan and a strategy on how you would do this. And they started, they just shoved the ship off the shore. Talk about into the deep. You know what I mean? Like they just, they got it. They got it going. And this is a school in Liverpool, New York. Within two months, they saw a huge impact. This is like, wow, this is like transformational impact. And so when my co-founder and I went up there and visited the school on Veterans Day weekend, uh, I'm sorry, during like, like the day before going into Veterans Day weekend, they just were spellbound by what was going on. And they told us that, Hey, we don't know whatever it is that you're doing right now, but you like, you need to take this and figure out how to bring this to more schools. So we really scaled from that one first school in the 2015, 2016 year, uh, into nearly 800 schools, you know, in 20 by 2021. And so the explosive growth has been happening all over the country. We're are working with a lot of Catholic schools, um, in Minneapolis, diocese of Los, you know, archdiocese of Los Angeles, uh, one of our first schools was St. Michael's up in Cary here in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we have a 32 week strategy where there's a daily 10 minute lesson. And so the key is consistency. So every day teachers, you know, they've got resources to drive the learning for the day to drive the discussion around humility, fairness, forgiveness, uh, enthusiasm, creativity, uh, the 24 different character strengths of positive psychology. And yeah, the impact on so many you know, students has, has been pretty big because they're learning about and they're hearing about these attributes, these virtues, these strengths on a daily basis. And it's changing fundamentally the way that they think about themselves and the way they think about other people. That's awesome. Mike. And so how can people, again, uh, is, is, I'm sure that uh, your website is probably the best way for them to find out more about the Positivity Project. Yes. Yep. POS project, POS project.org, you know, okay. or simple enough, right. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, um, you know, and, and I'm happy to connect further with you uh, on team red, white, and blue or the positivity project. I love hearing from people who are, are looking for, or are hungry, you know, to be involved in these causes that, uh, that I believe in so much. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but yeah, you can also find us on POS project.org. Now, one of the things that we highlighted in our uh, little bio of you at the beginning of the pro- uh, program is, uh, your two books that you wrote on leadership. And, you know, I was, I was thinking as I was looking over all of that, that there are so many voices about leadership that are out there right now, both, uh, you know, in uh, written materials, podcast, you name it, uh, and a, a lot of really great books and everything. What prompted you to kind of get into that world and begin to, to write on it? Yeah. Great, great question, father. Yeah. I mean, I sometimes, again, ask myself that same sort of question of like, what got me into it? Yeah. Um, you know, back in, when I was in grad school in 2010, my brother-in-law, who's my classmate from West Point, uh, was there clerking for a federal judge named Ray Kethledge. And, um, uh, I shared, you know, I read this article in, in a publication, um, and it was a speech given at West Point in the fall of 2009 by a guy named Bill Dershowitz, uh, called Solitude and Leadership. And he spent a lot of time in this talk 
discussing the power of like in the world and, and boy, oh boy, how much noisier and, and distracted has the world got since he gave that talk, you know, 13 years ago. But he spent a lot of time talking about for leaders, how critical it is to quiet the voices down and to go inward and to think and reflect. And, and he shared this. And so I shared this talk with, with a whole bunch of them to include Ray, who my, my brother-in-law introduced me to. And, and, you know, I said, this would be a really interesting topic to read a book on. And so I actually reached out to Bill Dershowitz and, and he said, Hey, I appreciate you reaching out, but you know, I'm writing my own book. I got other things going on. So if you want to read that book, then you should write it. And so that's when I talked to Ray, who, uh, you know, is a prolific writer. Um, and he was really stirred by the message and by all of it. He would say that when he would go up to his office in Northern Michigan, where he doesn't have Wi-Fi, uh, you know, that he's 10 to 15 IQ points smarter, right? When you just starve <laughs> yourself of the distractions, you just, yeah. you can think better and more clearly. And uh, so that's really, it was, it was a true passing project for seven years. I mean, we worked on it from 2010 until, well, six years, um, you know, when we turned the manuscript in, but it didn't come out until, you know, it's basically seven years from the day that we started it is when it released. So we stuck with it, you know, through the thick and thin and the ups and the downs, um, because, you know, it's difficult, like, you know, to go get a, a contract and to get like a publishing agency to get behind a book. And to, I mean, they got to really believe in it. Mm -hmm. Even if you have connections or relationships, a lot of times the answer is no, go self-publish it if you want to do that. And so uh, getting you know someone to really believe in us, um, they took a risk on us for sure. And uh, yeah, that began the journey of the first one. And then once you write a first one, the people's next question is, well, when's your next book coming out? And I said, nope, not writing a second book. Um, but after a couple of years in 2019, I started to feel like the itch of, you know, hey, I think I've got something else to contribute to the conversation. Because that's the thing. I didn't want to ever write, write a book that just contributes a bunch of noise, you know, and just piles on to what other people are saying. And so that's something I am really proud, or, proud about is both books that I've co-authored. I, I believe that they're unique contributions to the space of leadership, right? The role of solitude. Uh, and then, of course, the role of relationships and how in both cases, um, under this umbrella of the information age, it's become harder to think and focus and reflect. And it's also become harder to build meaningful relationships with people because we're so distracted and we have so much going on that relationships take time and energy and effort. And so I, I see the information age as being a challenge to both solitude and reflection and also to building relationships. And so that's the, the, the bridge between the two books. While they might sound very different, one's about solitude, one's about relationships. The common thread there is both are more difficult to do in the, in the world that we live in today. Well, Mike, we want to spend a chunk of time on uh, the nexus of our relationship uh, and how I got to meet and know you, Mike, and that's through your work in Catholic Ed and in particular your design and, and launching of a, of a really unique Catholic high school model, model Father Capadano. Um, one article we read about its founding said the school was as unique as the man it was named after. So we'd love for you just to share a bit about how you got involved in setting up a high school, no easy feat, um, and tell us about its model. Absolutely. So, you know, first up, so I'm a big brand person, right? You know, the team red, white, and blue, you know, you got the logo, you got the, e you know, you have an eagle with a star as the body and the positivity product is like the shield denoting strengths and a plus for positivity. You know, and so one of the first things we said, hey, we live outside a military community. And our first was, you know, St. Joan of Arc. We were going to name the school, you know, St. Joan of Arc. Um, and then, you know, one of the, who became a founding member of our board, Dr. Jeff Klotz, he was a, a colonel in the army and he talked about Father Emil Capon and he talked about Father Vincent Capadano and said, hey, I think we should really take a look at these two guys, you know, both Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, both Catholic chaplains in the military, Capon, of course, from Korea and then Capadano from Vietnam. And, and so we, and, you know, I read the book called The Grunt Padre uh, about Father Capadano. And I mean, boy, oh boy, how could you not be inspired by learning and hearing his story um, and how he lived his life? Um, so the, the, next, the genesis of the story is that one of my classmates from West Point, a guy by the name of Devin Capps, you know, a special forces guy, uh, he's, he and his wife have three biological children, five adopted, um, and his oldest you know, uh, adopted from Vietnam, Deacon. Uh, was in eighth grade and Devin came to me and said, Hey, Deacon's graduating St. John Paul II here in six months. And we really need to start a Catholic high school you know, around here. 
And, uh, you know, the nearest one to us is up in Raleigh, about an hour and 15 minute drive away, Cardinal Gibbons and St. And then St. Thomas More Academy. And so it's just an unrealistic drive for most people, especially in the military. If you got Fort Bragg, you, just, you can't do it. And so, you know, the, the feasibility studies from the diocese have always kind of pointed to the same thing. Hey, there's not enough of a critical mass. There's not enough people who can pay to be able to, to build all building, do all the work, you know, and then be able to, you know, afford to be able to pay the tuition. So we basically said, you know, we've got to do this. We, we've got to make the, you know, shove the ship off the shore. And so, you know, we did that. And so we're not, you know, we're not a diocese school. Um, you know, we are our own 501c3 with our own you know, board of directors, our own philosophies. Uh, of course, a lot of them are deeply rooted in Catholic tradition and the Catholic faith, right? I'd argue in many ways, you know, we're quote unquote more Catholic, right? Than, than you know, uh, a lot of Catholic schools out there, even though we're not, you know, recognized as a diocese school, at least as of yet. Um, and so that's how it began. It began with uh, four students, St. Anthony's uh, of Padua, uh, the, uh, the priest there said, hey, you can use this 10 by 12 room above our parish offices uh, <laughs> to, ed- to start educating your students. Uh, so we did. And that was the beginning, you know, uh, and we had four, two of those students left, uh, you know, one of them like PCS and, you know, left, you know, permanent change of station. One of them moved to Texas. So then we had two kids. And then when the next, the incoming class was three. So now our student body was five. And then the next year we grew and we had to go out and find like a different space for this point. Cause now you couldn't do the education in that 10, you know, 120 square feet. You had to go out and, and, and find like somewhere else. And so then we grew by nine. And so then we were 14 students. And, and so now we're 34 students, you know, growing uh, uh, ever so steadily. But, um, you know, we've had our first graduating class a few years, a year ago, almost a year ago. And now we've got our next graduating class here that goes out into the world in about three weeks. Now, Mike, on your website, one of the things you, you have your mission statement there that says that uh, the high school is there to develop resilient leaders armed with clarity and courage to pursue God's purpose for their lives. What does that mission look like as it's lived out with our with your students? It sounds really good as I hear you say that, Father. By the way, you got a, you got a great like announcer podcast voice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like I feel like you know usually like a voice actor, you know. Yeah. Um, no, that's exactly right. You know, we spend a lot of time you know tinkering with our mission statement. I'm a big believer in mission statements. Of course, they're nearly meaningless if you don't actually aspire to and work right. hard to to make them happen. But I do think that that azimuth, that northern star, is important to align people's actions around that. Um, you know, so we're unique in, in a whole bunch of ways. I'll just kind of highlight a couple of them. First of all, um, you know, the biggest thing that makes us unique is that 30% of our students' grades comes from uh, what we call skill, service, character, leadership. Um, and so on Wednesday, we go to mass in the morning out in the community, um, either at St. Anthony's or at Sacred Heart. It's a chance for the community to be able to see, hey, wow, like we're there in uniform. So they see that we've got you know, young men and women um, attending, uh, you know, our, our Catholic high school. Um, beyond that, we um, then go do community service. So we partner with like the Life Care Pregnancy Center and Special Olympics. And so some Catholic based or, or Christian based, some of them not, but either way, all of them focused on giving back and serving the people of the community. And so that is a big part of our model. And we then push our students to reflect on that, to learn more about that. So I wouldn't quite call it service learning and there's not as much academic rigor to it, at least as of yet, but it's more focused on doing, you know, roadside cleanup, working at the St. Anthony's food pantry, doing things like that. Um, You know, a big message to our students is that like when you're struggling or having a tough day, like the best thing you can do is to take your mind off of yourself and your own struggles and serve other people. We then, uh, in the afternoon, engage with them in a seminar that's based around character, leadership, and resilience. And so, as freshmen, that looks like they're learning about themselves, they're learning about virtue, they're learning about character, not a whole lot of experiential learning. But then sophomore and junior year, I work with them, and I'm their teacher. And we do military-themed style of training where they're lifting 400-pound tires and then I'm putting someone on top of them, right? And then they got to, you know, so real challenging, hard things. They're pushing cars up driveways. They're learning how to climb ropes um, and work together as teams. And I make them do things like that. If they're not communicating very well with each other in unison, they can't do it. You know, like you can't lift, you know, a 700 pound, two tires stacked on each other, unless you're listening 
to each other and you're lifting upward at the exact same time. So we do a lot of that kind of uh, training that has a more symbolic and allegorical message for their life. Um, and we also talk about, and we do some academic learning in there too, about self-talk and about the importance of getting sleep and the importance of reflection and conflict resolution and different communication styles. So it's a lot of like soft skills training. Um, and we do that um, in sophomore and junior year. And then senior year, they start working on like a, a capstone project where they're giving back and they're serving. So that's a big part of it, that Wednesday. So we got a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, right? Are your more traditional academic days, but that Wednesday is very different. And it's not different like, ah, hey, just do whatever you want. It's like 30% of your grade, right? And we, and we draw that inspiration from the service academies where you know, a large part of your grade is not just your academics, it's your military and it's your physical. Um, the other big way that we're different, I would highlight, is that we have you know, intercession. So the first two weeks of the year, and then in, in the springtime, we have intercession where um, our students go out and they take two weeks and they go hiking together. They learn survival skills. They go volunteer, you know, um, in the Appalachia uh, and, and build ramps for families that can't afford it. Um, they intern and they go out in there and they say, yeah, I'm interested possibly in being a nurse. I'm going to go intern with someone here in the medical field or, you know, whatever it might be. So we really push them to get out and to discover some of their passions and also to get outside of the, the standard school day and the standard, you know, ebb and flow right, of, of the experience, you know, in their life when they're going to school every day, you know? So like, those are a couple of the big ways, you know, that we are, are, are really different. Uh, in our model. And, you know, much like the, you know, the model of the Crystal Ray model, right, where you they were able to prove that you can still exceed <laughs> academic standards and expectations by going to school four and sometimes three days a week, that you're building these life skills in students that actually will pay off for them um, in big, big ways down the road to include getting into college if that's the road that they choose to go, right, or the military or go start their own business or go work, whatever they want to do, Again, we want to arm our students with that clarity and then the courage, right, to go forth and, and pursue not like just what they want to do, but really, you know, God's purpose for their life. Wednesday sounds a lot to me like boot camp. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, got, it's got a little it's got a little bit of that, you know, a flavor to it, but we intentionally make it hard. But they've come to actually love those days, you know, and you oh, see yeah. that like like a lot of young men and women are, are craving those physical challenges where they've got to work with each other. Sometimes they bark at each other and they got to learn how to work through conflict. Um, the consequences at times are real. Like, you know, if you drop that 500, you know, 400 pound tire on you, that's gonna, it's gonna hurt. So like, I'm mm -hmm. a big believer and you've got to make the consequences real. If you want people to take the training as seriously as you can be. Like you've got some audacious goals and dreams for father Capadano, um, as well as this model share a little bit about that. Sure. So I, you know, have thought about this a lot, you know, in terms of, and we're approaching again, five years old, you know, here in, in, uh, well, this is May. So five years. Um, and, you know, I thought about this a lot of like, because every year, a couple of our students, at least their parents leave Fort Bragg and they go get assigned to a different base or a different station. And one of the biggest challenges that so many face, um, is that they, will their parents will go to Fort Carson or Fort Trump or whatever. And then those students who are in high school go and they got to get into a whole new system. So like one of the, the aspirations we have is to slowly over time to add a Capadano at Fort outside of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And, you know, at Fort Carson, Colorado and Fort Lewis, Washington, and, you know, at least starting first with the army bases, but then eventually hopefully go into near like the Navy bases, the air force bases you know, that exists out there and the Marine Corps bases so that, students can, when they transfer, when mom or dad gets the call to go somewhere else, uh, that they can just assimilate into the new Father Capadano school and just continue their model. So in a way, create essentially like a, what is a Catholic charter system so that families of the military that are moving, you know, don't have to go and start all over when they get to like, you know, a new big school in the area. Well, I can see how that could really work. I was pastor of a parish uh, just outside of uh, Fort Riley in, uh, Man you know, in Manhattan, yes. Kansas. And uh, one of the things we used to say is that having a parish like that is like preaching to a parade because people are constantly Absolutely. coming and going. And one of the things we constantly heard was when people would go someplace else, I wish we had this about our mm -hmm. parish where we are now. It would really be great. 
Yep. And so I can see how that would have such validity, especially with that kind of a mobile society, a mobile community with the military. Yep. That's it, Father. So that's 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 a very audacious goal because the amount of funding needed to be able to do it and make it all happen. But like every little last bit of this thus far for our first five years has been putting the trust in God, you know, through the intercession of Father Capadano and like like he has not let us down yet, you know. And so I'm confident that if that is the direction, you know, that, that God wants us to go, right, and we have clarity on it, it's going to happen, you know. And it's just a matter of patience, right? Because you can't make it happen overnight, but it's also a matter of um, just trust in the plan um, that that's what's meant to be will be. And, and I'm pretty confident that as of right now, that's what's meant to be. Have you ever talked with the archdiocese of the military about this? Not about this idea yet. Um, I have spoken with uh, Archbishop Berlio, um, actually in our very first year, because uh, Father Capadano was killed on September 4th, 1967. So in 2017, I was actually promoted to Lieutenant Colonel at the Pentagon that morning. And that evening uh, in the crypt of uh, the cathedral, they held an unbelievable mass for you know, remembering Father Capadano on the 50th oh, wow. anniversary of him being killed mm -hmm. in action. And there was there had to be 50 or 60 priests there. I mean, it was unbelievable. And so long story short is like they know about our high school, but they just know about it as, as being at the doorsteps of Fort Bragg. Um, you know, we're not quite ready yet when I study and I have great hope when I look at the Crystal Ray, right? They started, you know, via the Jesuits in the you know, south side of Chicago in 1996. And I think they were there for seven, eight years before they started to start saying we can export this model and bring it elsewhere. Now, the Jesuits have a network to be able to kind of you know, help propel that forward. Um, but so does the military and so does the Catholic community. So I think that it's a matter of, you know, who else is hungry for this, you know, for their own children or for, you know, Catholic children, you know, that happen to be in the military. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to be an exciting journey whenever, whenever that, that green light, you know, drops. Mike, having spent most of your life up to now focusing on, on teaching Catholic ed and equipping others in the important domain of leadership, do you think there's a leadership crisis in our Catholic schools today? Yes. I mean, I think that, um, you know, choose my words carefully, of course, as always, you know, I think that there's certainly a leadership crisis. Uh, it abounds uh, in the world, in our society, in America, especially. Uh, I don't think that, you know, like Catholic education is uh, immune to that. I think that, you know, the hard part here is that as everyone's gotten a voice and as more and more people have been given a microphone or been given social media or email, they've got a way to, you know, it's harder and harder for leaders to be able to stay the course that they know they should be on because they're swayed and they're influenced and they feel like beat down by the voices out there, the angry people, the people who are frustrated. And I think that, you know, the idea that, you know, Catholic education, right, you know, for you know, lots of places has become more, I understand why, I totally see it, right, about college placement and about, you know, athletic performance, you know, and, and scholarships, you know, to college and all that, I understand why, because it brings in money, it brings in notoriety, and things, right? But is that truly what we're called to do, like in the Catholic education uh, sector? And, and I think that we're trying to bring the conversation back to, hey, we have a sports program, it's very small, right? But it's never going to become the emphasis or the focus of what we do, right? It will always be in service to um, the bigger picture, right, of developing resilient leaders, you know, armed with the clarity and the courage to pursue God's purpose for their lives, right? And that means, again, the big, the three big A's, the athletics, the arts, and academics, right? And all those things matter. We all know they're important, but they are not the most important, right? right? Um, and I go back to, you know, quoting Matthew Kelly's, you know, you know, thought about like, you know, like the greatest house in the world doesn't make a good warehouse and, and the best warehouse in the world doesn't make a good home, right? You've got to get your purpose right. Yep. And that's why that mission statement is so important. And our mission statement right. really driving our purpose means that we can make with clarity decisions of no, we're not going to go this far in this direction to pursue the athletics, the arts or academics, right? To supplant the, the real Northern star of what we're trying to do within our students. You know, being mission-minded. Yes, sir. Um, Mike, through uh, Father Capadano High School, uh, through the Positivity Project, you've had an opportunity to be with teachers, to see teachers, and to kind of interact. What do you see, especially with our Catholic schools, what is the greatest need that you think our Catholic school teachers have right now? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, as I look at the, the challenges that, that everyone faces, I, I do think that, uh, you know, right now, and, and I look at this as the biggest challenge, I think that most people in education face is burnout. You know, we hear it over and over again. I, I see principals getting into positions for a period of time and then, then leaving. Um, you know, teachers tapping out like early retiring, typically who might have taught into 55 or 58. And now they're, they're saying, Hey, I'm, I'm good at age 45, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that that real burnout, and this is not just within Catholic education, this is across all sectors, learning how to be able to shut work off and to not allow the distractions of work to beat you down at like 11 o'clock at night as you're trying to fall asleep. Or, you know, at eight o'clock when you get back home or in your home after running around doing errands and doing stuff you know, or doing the, char the chores here on the farm, whatever it might be. Yeah, I, I think that the mind, it's not like you can just put up a silo, you know, and block it all, right? Or, you know, put up like a, a wall and say, oh, nah, I'm not going to think about it anymore. So if you don't work to develop that skill set and those muscles, then I think it's hard. It's really hard, you know, to, to, to remain fired up about the work you're doing because it's going to be just wearing you down just neurologically in your brain and it seeps into your soul. So I think that that burnout is real, that a lot of people are facing it, especially in education. I think, especially in Catholic education. And I think that that's why lead yourself first. The topic of that, my first book, I think is, is more important than ever. We really need our, our people, teachers, leaders, et cetera, to prioritize how they lead and how they shut off the distractions and shut off the noise so they can recharge every day and come back energized that next day. Cause if you don't, um, it mounts up pretty quickly and it feels like an overwhelming situation. Like this has been just an awesome and inspiring conversation. I walk away every time I have a chance to chat with you really jazzed, um, uh, uh about your work and inspired by, uh, all you're accomplishing. And so, uh, I appreciate getting to know you, Mike, even better uh, through this conversation today. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate it. Likewise, it's great to be able to spend some time with both of you. Uh, definitely. I was sitting here thinking, uh, Kyle, we have to come, come back one more time on the, uh, the positive, uh, the positivity characteristics, those 20 yes. plus we characteristics. We can have a separate podcast, Father exactly. Randy, on, on that approach. Absolutely. Yeah. That's something Absolutely. we will definitely have to work on. Uh, again, Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, if people want to know, again, Positivity uh, Project is what website? Yeah, POS Project. So POS Project.org. Um, so, yeah, very simple. Um, okay. Yep. Team, team RBW. Yep. RWB.org. RWB org. Yes, sir. And and then for uh, Father Vincent Capadano High School, if they want to kind of get a little, you've got a wonderful website. I just want to say it's kind Thank of you. fun. It kind of gives you a little glimpse into what you're doing and especially being able to see how you uh, have kind of crafted what you call your scholars project that yes. involves all of those different areas that that you outlined today. And they can find that where. So, yeah, so you can go to I think it's CapadanoHigh.org. And uh, you can do that there. Or again, like just reach out to me and happy to share some additional resources. But, you know, our website's good. It's gotten a lot better for sure. We've had some help, some, some fired up parents stepping forward to, to contribute. But, you know, it's, uh, it's even more impressive when you see it in person and you follow us on Instagram and you see some of the stories um, of what we do. Um, actually, we have like a big social media, you know, um, you know, focus to be able to tell the story, you know, of our students right. and our models. So. Well, very good. And we're eager to hear later on what you uh, name your cow when you get your, your dairy cow. So <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, they, uh, my wife's in charge of that, but we got to make the, uh, the leap here, hopefully sooner rather than later. But um, I do feel the pressure. Definitely. Uh, she just went to a class last weekend. She, she's all fired up about it. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. It has been been our delight to, to just be able to, to talk with you today. And Likewise. also uh, for our audience, uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast and be sure to leave a comment in order to encourage us through uh, development of our, of our future programs. We'd also like to thank our intern, Alex Shire, for assisting us in the production of this podcast. May Almighty God bless you. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Follow to Lead, a production of the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative. To learn more about finding your own path in your journey of faith, or for more information on what we discussed in today's episode, you are invited to follow us on social media and visit us on the web at diaschools.org. 
To provide a one-time donation or monthly pledge, please visit our website. Your gift will aid us in providing up-to-date information, additional resources, and other support on how to take Catholic education to a higher level. We look forward to helping you follow God's call to lead others to God, right here on Follow to Lead.